All right, so this lecture is about the single biggest issue in the time period, slavery. From the, well, really from the nation's founding, but, real, but, but realistically, 1840 to 1865, it is the driving force in every decision that's made in this nation's history, okay? Everything is about slavery. So let's kind of get us into this. When we left off in the age of Jackson lecture, we were talking about the last slide was the election of 1840. So we're going to kind of pick up there. 1840 is going to be a repeat of the 36 election. You're going to have William Henry Harrison against Martin Van Buren again. That's William Henry Harrison there on the left. Martin Van Buren on the right. Martin Van Buren is the incumbent. He was the uh, hand-chosen successor to Andrew Jackson. But as I've mentioned to you before, if you ever want to get into politics, you don't want to follow somebody that was popular. He follows Andrew Jackson, and people are not going to be pleased with the way he does things. Because he's not Andrew Jackson. He's going to make everybody mad. Uh, he was also left in a really bad place where a lot of Jackson's poor economic decisions, like the pet banks and the war on the bank, had left a nation ready to collapse. And the collapse happens under Van Buren. This time, William Henry Harrison is going to do better than he did the first time. Because he does something interesting. The Whig Party is the anti-Jackson party. It was founded by people that didn't like Andrew Jackson. That was its sole purpose. But now you have William Henry Harrison running in the Whig Party, but running kind of as Jackson. He runs as a common man. He runs on his military record. This is the guy that defeated Tecumseh in the War of 1812. He runs as a tough guy commoner. In fact, we call it the Log Cabin Campaign because his whole campaign slogan is that he was born in a log cabin and that he's a frontier man and a common man just like you and me and that he'd rather be sitting on the front porch in his rocking chair drinking hard cider than be president. He says, I don't even want the job as president. I'm just like you. And America likes that. We like a president that's like us. That's why we elected Jackson. We like a tough guy. We like that kind of stuff. He runs with a guy named John Tyler of Virginia, who had been a Democrat for years, but had a falling out with Andrew Jackson and had left the Democrat Party to become a Whig. And they got the greatest campaign slogan of all time. Tip a canoe and Tyler too. You'll never forget it. It's got such a great sound to it. Why tip a canoe? Well, because William Henry Harrison was the guy that defeated Tecumseh at the Battle of tip a canoe They want to link into his military record. So tip a canoe and this guy also, right? Martin Van Buren gets his butt kicked. It ends up being 234 to 60. One of the most lopsided victories in American presidential political history. Now, I always like to do a show of hands, but since we're on three campuses, you can't do it. I always like to ask, how many, uh, how many people think William Henry Harrison was a great president? And most of you will look at me like we didn't even know he was president. Well, first off, he was the single oldest man ever elected president. He was 68 years old when he became president. That's not true anymore. Uh, Donald Trump is older as when he became, became president. And Reagan was older when he was re-elected. But he was the oldest man to, to ever be elected president until this last one. Um, and he had this tough guy image. So he went out and he gave a three-hour inaugural address on the front steps of the White House during a blizzard and refused to wear a coat because he thought a coat made him look weak. He wanted to look like a tough guy. So he's standing out in a blizzard without a coat giving a three-hour speech. 
He caught pneumonia. He went to bed. And he died 28 days later. So William Henry Harrison was only president for 28 days. Okay? We'll never know if he was going to be a great president. All that work. 28 days of president. All right. So what that's going to do is it's going to raise this guy, John Tyler, to the office of the president. And John Tyler was a terrible choice. Uh, he was a man without a party. Remember, he had been a Democrat most of his life until he had a falling out with Jackson. And he left and became a Whig. That's going to mean the Democrats don't like him because he left their party to become a Whig. But the Whigs don't like him because he used to be a Democrat. Okay? So he literally has no party. He comes into power as the first vice president to be raised to the office of the president because of death. And it's questionable how he becomes president to begin with. Today, if I asked you what happens when the president dies, you would all tell me the vice president becomes the president. And you'd be right. But did you know that nowhere in the Constitution, at least before the, uh, uh, the amendment process was changed, nowhere in the original draft of the Constitution does it say that the vice president becomes the president? In fact, what it says is, upon the death or disability of a president, the vice president shall take the authority of the president. Now, what does that mean, take the authority? Well, today we go, that means he becomes the president. But back then they would have said, it doesn't mean he becomes the president, it means he's the acting president until we could have another election. John Tyler didn't agree with that. And he was friends with a just with one of the Supreme Court justices. So he gets this Supreme Court justice to come over with a Bible and, and swear him in. He swears the oath and he just takes the presidency. And he establishes that precedent. But that's going to make a lot of people very angry. They're going to feel like he's... Uh, He's not acting properly. So much so that all of his executive departments, the entire cabinet with the exception of Daniel Webster, resigns rather than stay in politics under John Tyler. I think there were six cabinet level offices then. He's not going to be able to get a lot done. John Tyler is going to raise the tariff rate back to 32%. Uh, that's going to make people angry in the South. He's going to be determined, excuse me, determined to take Texas and make it part of the United States. But he can't get the bill through Congress because Congress won't give him a victory. By the way, this is why we have a town, Tyler, Texas why there's John Tyler High School, why there's all stuff like that, is because of this guy tried to add Texas. He was a good voice for Texas. Uh, he, by the way, later in life, was also the uh, uh, founder of the Ku Klux Klan, so that's kind of an issue. Uh, by the way, there's something interesting about it. I don't know if y'all are aware, but he actually... Because he had children so late in his life, and his son, he had children in his 60s. And then his son had children in his 60s. He has a grandson that's still alive today. It's like in his 80s now, but he has a living grandson. So that's, that, that's kind of amazing if you think about it. All right. So John Tyler's not going to have a good presidency. He would like to run for a second term, but there's no way he's going to get his party's nomination. So in 1844, we have another election. This time, the Whigs nominate Henry Clay. And if you look at this picture, he's looking more and more like Hillary Clinton as we age him. Um, 
And James K. Polk, who strangely looks like a character from Harry Potter, mm -hmm. that's him there on the right, or Dracula, James K. Polk gets the nod from the Democrat Party. These are interesting characters. Henry Clay is expected to win this easily. He is a hugely popular president, presidential candidate. This is his fourth time running for president. He, uh, he had been the youngest speaker of the House ever. Now he's quite a, quite a bit older. He was known as the Great Compromiser. He was probably the most powerful person in the Congress. Running as a Whig. But the Democrats chose this guy, James K. Polk, who was almost unknown outside of his home state of Tennessee. But they loved him in Tennessee. In fact, they called him Little Hickory. Remember, Andrew Jackson was Old Hickory? They called this guy Little Hickory because he modeled himself after Jackson. He didn't believe the government should do a lot, but when they, when they promised to do something, they should do it. He's what we call a dark horse candidate. He was not expected to do well. But as the election gets closer and closer, this dark horse in the background keeps getting closer and closer and closer. And finally, on election day, James K. Polk defeats Henry Clay 170 to 105. Shocks everybody. Nobody expected this to happen. Why was he able to do this? Well, part of it was the fact that John Tyler had kind of screwed some things up as a Whig. Uh, and people wanted the glory days of, of Jackson back. So they went back to this Democrat party and he reminded them of Andrew Jackson. That shouldn't surprise you. Remember the last time William Henry Harrison won by pretending to be Jackson. Now, Tyler became president and did the opposite. Well, now they have a chance to get to somebody else that's pretending to be Jackson, okay? Jackson can still be felt all the way through this. So he's now president. Now, I want to talk about James K. Polk because he's an interesting character that is almost completely forgotten from history, unfortunately. But if you asked me to name the five greatest presidents, James K. Polk would probably make my list. which sounds weird, but here's why. James K. Polk said, when he was elected president, they said, what are you gonna do? He said, this is what I'm gonna do as president. I'm gonna lower the tax rate. I'm gonna take Oregon from England, because there, there was a border dispute in Oregon, whether it was English or American. I'm gonna take Texas, And I'm going to do it all in four years and go home. So he makes three promises. I only, he only promises to do three things. At the end of his four years as president, he has done everything he promised to do. As far as I know, he is the only president in history that accomplished every one of his goals. Texas became a state in the United States. We settled the boundary with Oregon, and we didn't get all of it, but we got most of it. He lowered the tariff rate, and he was so hugely popular, they asked him to run again, and he said, nope, I told you I was going to do it in one term, and he went home. I like that. I can really respect that. You know, he had some health issues, too, that, that caused him to do that. But that's something we don't see a lot of. This is also the president that got us into a little war. It's the Mexican War. Now, land disputes were a big problem. I've got two maps up here. The one on the left is the Oregon area. Uh, and you can see on that map, the disputed area there is kind of in, in peachy colors. That's an area that both the U.S. and England claimed. We got it. At least we got most of it. And this picture on the right is what Texas looked like at the time period. And that's the area that he decides he wants. Okay? Now, how are we going to go about getting this? What are we going to end up doing? 
The question is the boundary dispute. We annexed Texas in 1845. But if you look at this map, you can see that there's a difference in the boundaries. The United States recognized that the Rio Grande is the southern, southern border of Texas. The Rio Grande is that area there at the bottom by, uh, the, at, on the far left of the green. Mexico believed the Nueces River was the boundary, which is this area up here by the, uh, by the yellow. Now, if you look at that, that creates a massive area. That, all that green area is disputed. It's claimed by both Mexico and the United States. So what do we do? We really want to go to war with Mexico. We want to go to war bad. Why do we want to go to war? Well, we kind of like to have places like California, Utah, Nevada, Colorado. We want all that area. That's still part of Mexico. So we picked a fight. And make no mistake about it, we picked a fight. The president sent a message to General Zachary Taylor where he said to go down and enforce the southern border of Texas. Well, okay. What's the southern border? Again, Mexico thinks it's the Nueces River. America says it's the Rio Grande. This is an American general. So he crosses the Nueces River and he moves down towards the Rio Grande. And when he crosses the Nueces River, the Mexican government shoots at him for invading Mexico. A telegram is sent to the president that says, American blood has been shed on American soil. And we asked for a declaration of war because they shot at us on American soil. We got the declaration of war and the Mexican war it began. Now, let me ask you something. Could Mexico just as easily have said Mexican blood has been shed on Mexican soil? Sure, they could have. This was disputed land. We invaded and picked a fight. We knew they were going to shoot at us. We wanted them to shoot at us. It gave us an excuse to go to war. Now, there's something that they call the spot resolutions. I find this fascinating. Here's the deal. Mexico had outlawed slavery a generation earlier. And the reasons Texans declared independence in, in 1836 and joined the U.S. in 1845 was open was because they wanted slaves. That was a lot of the reason. Well, a young congressman from Illinois, a one-term member of the House of Representatives named Abraham Lincoln, introduced a bill to try and stop the Mexican War. It's called the Spot Resolutions. Where Abraham Lincoln said, and I love this, he said, we're not really going to war over the issue of slavery on a spot on the map. He said we should not be going to war over the issue of slavery. That was in 1845. In 1861, we go to war over the issue of slavery, and Lincoln's the one that does it. Okay? But at this time, that question is there. The other general we send is Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott's the guy at the top right. They called him Old Fluff and Feathers. Winfield Scott, now that's an old picture of him. He didn't look that great there, but he was, he was known for always looking very professional, very much like a general. He would wear his perfect uniform, and his boots would be shine, and his brass would be perfect, and his men were well turned out and could march better than anybody. But guys, he is a, he's been around a long time. He was a, an officer in the War of 1812. It's 1845 now, 30 plus years later, okay? Winfield Scott leads a group of soldiers to invade Veracruz in Mexico and march north. Zachary Taylor, they called him Old Rough and Ready, that's him at the bottom. 
He was total. He was the opposite of, of, of Winfield Scott. He rarely shaved. He drank too much. He wore an old, a, a private's uniform because it was more comfortable than a general's uniform. And they had two different theories about how to fight a war. Winfield Scott tried to win people over. When he would go into a town, Winfield Scott would try to save as many civilians as he could, and they would repair any damage they did. So if they, would, if they had to go into a town and destroy things, he would have a group of soldiers behind that rebuilt the churches and rebuilt the schools because he doesn't believe in having war on individuals. Zachary Taylor would burn villages, burn crops, kill women and children. He didn't care. Two different theories. Now, they both work. Zachary Taylor ends up being the big hero here because he has the... Uh, uh, he wins the, the most important battle, the Battle of Buena Vista. At the Battle of Buena Vista, you look at these numbers, 5,000 Americans defeat 20,000 Mexicans. Now, why was that possible? There was a technological change. We had rifles and they had muskets. A musket's accurate up to about 30 feet. A rifle is accurate up to about 150 yards. So our small group could just stand outside of range and shoot at them. Yes? Isn't it a long process to reload a musket? It's a very long process to reload a musket, yeah. And the rifles, they were still single shot and you had to, you had to cock it, but you didn't have to put the powder in, they, you know, they, they came with cartridges. So yeah, it's a good point. We were so successful in the Mexican War that we forced Mexico to sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gave the United States all Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande. We, we just got all of it. Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, California, okay? Uh, Nevada, I think I named them all. Uh, here's the deal. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. We won a war, we got all this land, but we also agreed to pay Mexico $15 million for it. Now, if our justification for this war was we own the land anyway, remember American blood on American soil, why are we paying for it when the war is over? Or why couldn't you just buy the land in the first place? Well, they wouldn't sell it to us. We tried that. It's a good point. But what this tells me as a historian is we knew we didn't really own that land. We went in, we picked a fight, and now we're going, all right, now you can have your money. Here's some hush money. Shut up and go away. Okay? We do this all the time. We do this all the time. So what is the outcomes of the Mexican War? The Mexican War was a relatively painless war for us. Uh, now, it's not going to seem painless because these numbers are going to seem large, but about 13,000 Americans died. That is a small number for a war at that time period. That's a very small number. So it felt painless to us. It's a small enough number that most Americans didn't know somebody that died, okay? The next thing it does is it gets us the respect of the world as a real nation. Because, think about it, it's now 1845 and we have defeated England twice in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and now defeated Mexico once. We are the undefeated champions of the world at this point, okay? We are Rocky Balboa. <laughs> We went the distance. Uh, the next thing that it does, though, is it reinvigorates the slave question. See, here's the problem. Our Congress was split. We had the same number of slave states as free states. And now we're going to add all of these territories from Mexico. That's going to skew the balance. And we don't really know what way it's going to skew it. Because you're adding places where slavery 
where they wanted slavery, but slavery had been illegal for 30 years in Mexico. So slavery was already illegal there. So the question is, are we adding them as slave states, because they'd like to be, or are we adding them as free states? Either way, you're going you're gonna to screw up the balance. David Wilmot of Pennsylvania introduced the Wilmot Proviso. which if it would have passed, would have made slavery illegal in any land captured in the Mexican War. It does pass the House twice, but it never passes the Senate. That shows you something. The House of Representatives is much more abolitionist than the Senate. And that's what you would expect. You expect the Senate to always fall behind the House because they're only elected once every six years instead of every two years. Okay, well, if they are elected every six years, what if they die before? Like, if you die, the, yeah. the, your, uh, your governor appoints somebody to fill the position, and it's approved by the state legislature until a new election can be held. What's really interesting is when, when a candidate dies while they're running for office and then they win anyway, you gotta figure out what to do. <laughs> That's happened before. You can't just choose the second runner up or something. Uh -uh. What happens is the uh, the governor has to appoint and then there's a special election to, to fill the uh, fill the seat. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we uh was it I think it was Missouri that, he, that that elected a dead man to the Senate a few years ago. He died two weeks before the election. Y'all got it? All right, so if you want to know what it looks like, what we got, the Mexican session is that block over there that includes Canada and all that. And, of course, you see Texas. Uh, Texas gets its new shape at this time period. We sell off the other land uh, to pay off our war debts. But, you know, that's a pretty big, big change. You take the Louisiana Purchase and that, and you've tripled the size of the United States very, very quickly. All right, 1848. The Democrats nominate General Lewis Cass. That's him at the bottom there on the bottom left. He was the originator of the idea of popular sovereignty for slavery. You remember popular sovereignty? It's the belief that uh, people have the ultimate power. So what he, his idea was, all these states that we added, we just have a popular election in that state, and the state could choose whether to be free or slave. Okay, that's great. But it doesn't really solve the problem of the imbalance. We're still going to have an imbalance in Congress, probably, unless they split. The Whigs nominate Zachary Taylor at the top, old rough and ready, the hero of the Battle of Buena Vista. And again, why do they why do they they pick him? Because they know the pattern. Americans want a general. And he runs as a tougher than nails common man. He runs as Andrew Jackson. Okay, he does the same thing William Henry Harrison does. It works very very well. A brand new party called the Free Soilers, which was an abolitionist party, nominated Martin Van Buren, the man who won in 1836 and got his butt kicked in 1840, a failed presidential candidate. And you have this weird situation where the biggest issue of the day is slavery, okay? And the people that are pro-slavery love Lewis Cass because they believe that these states are all going to vote to be slavery. They, they want to vote for Cass. The people that are against slavery 
like Martin Van Buren, because he wants there to be no slavery anywhere in the country. But then they ask Zachary Taylor about his issue, and Zachary Taylor refuses to take a side on any issue. He talks around the questions. He doesn't answer. Nobody knows where he stands on the issue of slavery. Nobody knows where he stands on any issues. When they ask him a question, he just says, I won the Battle of Buena Vista. Vote for me. And if you want to know how to get elected president, that's how you do it. You don't take a side because you don't make anybody mad. You think about it, Martin Van Buren being a, a, an ardent abolitionist is going to make all the slave owners mad. Lewis Cass being a pro-slavery guy is going to make all the abolitionists mad. Nobody's mad at Zachary Taylor because everybody kind of thinks he's on their side. What a way to win the presidency. He was a terrible president, by the way. Uh, Zachary Taylor didn't, I don't think he really even wanted to be president. I think he didn't know what else to do after he retired and there was no more, no more fighting. Because uh, he kind of let the Senate run things. He kind of let his cabinet run things. He kind of just sat back and took advice and, and went along with whatever his advisors told him to do. That's not unusual. Reagan was kind of like that. I think Trump's a lot like that. Uh, both Bushes were kind of like that. Kennedy was like that. Johnson sometimes. You know, it's just kind of how it works. Y'all got this? If I go too fast, y'all let me know, guys. Here's the problem. Taylor didn't last very long. He dies. He has a heart attack. Well, maybe it was a heart attack. There is speculation that he was poisoned. He, uh, Taylor went in and drank a, it was a hot day, he went in and drank a pitcher of lemonade and then started complaining about his stomach hurting and, uh, and chest pains, and he was dead later that day. Uh, they did do a, an autopsy. They, they dug his body up a few years ago and did an autopsy, and they found trace amounts of arsenic in his stomach. Uh, some people have said that this means that he was poisoned. Most doctors say that arsenic was in everything back then. They would expect everybody to have trace amounts in it. So uh, we don't know what happened to him, but, but he dies kind of mysteriously. Uh, Taylor dies in 1850, and this guy, Millard Fillmore, becomes president of the United States. Millard Fillmore was a bachelor. We like to chase women and drink a lot. Uh, he was not really a great presidential candidate. He looked strangely like Alec Baldwin playing Donald Trump up there. Uh, but he's going to be stuck with the issue of solving this slavery issue in the Mexican land, the Mexican session. And they come up with what they call the Compromise of 1850. You will need this. This is super important. The three giants of the Senate, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and Douglas, Stephen Douglas, speak on behalf of this compromise. They said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to let California enter the Union as a free state. Slavery wouldn't work well in California anyway. The land's not good for plantations. So California, free state. Utah and New Mexico would be allowed to use popular sovereignty, and it was generally believed that Utah would, be, would vote to be abolitionist because of the Mormons, and uh, New Mexico would vote to be slavery. That's what happened. Texas, in order to buy them off, we gave up our claim to that disputed land for $10 million and repayment of our war debt. So Texas was out of debt, but we were a little smaller than we used to be. Our capital, Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, would allow slavery, but would not allow 
the slave trade. So what that means is you could own slaves, but you couldn't buy and sell them. This is because we didn't want that to be in their streets. It was kind of embarrassing. Most of the world had outlawed slavery by this time. And we didn't want ambassadors coming from around the world and seeing us selling people on the street corner. Okay? It was very embarrassing for us. And finally, there would be a harsh fugitive slave law. Incredibly harsh. If you were a free black man, you had to carry your papers with you. And if anybody asked to see them, you had to show them your papers that said you were free. If you were not, slave catchers could grab you if you couldn't prove you were free uh, and return you to your owners or sell you off again. Uh, this is very, very harsh. Because one of the things they would do sometimes, and there's been, there were a lot of reported cases where somebody would come up to you and say, I need to see your papers, and you'd show them to them, and they would then tear the papers up or throw them in the fire and say he doesn't have papers and throw you back into slavery. This happened a lot. So is this a good compromise? Remember, a compromise... A good compromise, everybody gives up a little something and everybody feels like they won something. So, did the free, the people that were against slavery get something? Yeah, they got California as a free state. Did the pro-slavery people get something? Yep, they got a harsh fugitive slave law. Uh, they're going to end up getting New Mexico because of popular sovereignty. They're going to get to keep the slave trade in, in, in D.C. And then popular sovereignty people get Utah and New Mexico to get to vote. Everybody gets something. It's a pretty good compromise for the time period. I don't know what they could have done better. I would have loved to have seen them just outlaw slavery completely, but that wasn't really a compromise. All right. So for the last three election cycles, we've seen the Whigs as the second party. So whatever happened to the Whigs? Why don't we have Whigs anymore? Well, the Whigs are going to self-destruct. Here's a lesson for you in politics. If your political party cannot take a stand on the single biggest issue in the world, your political party will not exist. And the single biggest issue in the whole world was slavery. And the Democrat Party was for slavery, and the Whig Party couldn't decide if they were for slavery or against it. They ended up splitting into two parties. The Cotton Whigs, and the conscience Whigs. The cotton Whigs were pro-slavery. Think about it. They need slaves to pick their cotton. They're cotton Whigs. And the conscience Whigs were anti-slavery. Think about it. Your conscience is that thing that tells you right from wrong. So they're not able to unite. And that's going to cause them to have difficulty in winning elections. 1852, the Democrats nominate this guy, Franklin Pierce, another dark horse candidate. He had served in the Mexican War, but he, but he got shot in the leg in the opening minutes of, of, of the battle and spent the rest of the war hurt. So he wasn't exactly a war hero, he was, uh, but, but he was in the war. The Whigs, true to form, nominated another general. They nominated Winfield Scott. That's him at the bottom. Here's the problem. By this time, America is getting sick of this pattern of generals. And frankly, Winfield Scott is in his 70s by this point. And he's not the young, good-looking man he was when he was, was when he first started, when they called him old fuss and feathers. He's now well over 300 pounds. He's tired, he looks like an old man, 
And the Democrats win this election in a landslide, another dark horse candidate, somebody that nobody really even knew about. Nobody knew this guy. All we knew was we didn't want Winfield Scott. So Pierce comes in. The Pierce administration is an expansionist administration. They really want the United States to grow. So the first thing they did is they purchased this strip of land from Mexico called the Gadsden Purchase. And you can see where it is. It stretches from El Paso to California. It's a real narrow strip. But it's important because it goes south of the highest peaks of the Rocky Mountains. And it's got a pass in it so you can get a railroad, get a train through. We needed to build a transcontinental railroad from Texas to California. So we bought this land. That was a pretty good purchase. Paid $10 million for it. By the way, that's, you know, we only paid $15 million for all of Louisiana. We paid $10 million for that strip. Not quite as good of a land deal. Pierce also announced that he wanted to capture Cuba and Canada. He wanted to go to war and invade Cuba, capture it, and then invade Canada and capture it. In both cases, he failed to get the uh, Congress to go along with it. It's unfortunate with Cuba. I think that would be awesome. But, you know, whatever. And then they passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was praised for being a powerful, powerful law, but in reality probably pushed us into the Civil War. It was pushed through by Stephen Douglas, who really wants to make a name for himself as a future president presidential candidate. And he called for the, for the use of popular sovereignty in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, and they would get to vote whether it be slave or free. Now, that's fine. Everybody expects Nebraska to, to vote against it, and it did. It's cold in Nebraska. Slavery is not going to work well there. But Kansas... Kansas would be good slave territory. Here's the problem. If they pass this law, they are in effect nullifying the Compromise of 1820. They're getting rid of that old Missouri Compromise. They're going to allow slavery into any place that will vote it. Okay? I'll give you just a minute to finish writing down. Y'all got it? take us into the problem in Kansas. Now, Kansas has an interesting law. They still have it today, by the way. There was a book written about it a few years ago called The Trouble with Kansas. In the state of Kansas, back then and still today, you can move to Kansas, register to vote, and vote all on the same day. Okay? Most states, you gotta got to live there for a while before you can register to vote. Not Kansas. You can go in there, you can move in, you can vote. Well, they're going to have this big vote as to whether it be a slave state or a free state. And whatever Kansas decides is going to swing the, the balance of power. It's going to give one side or the other an extra vote in the Senate. And the slave owners are worried that if it goes free, 
that the Senate will vote to make slavery illegal everywhere. And the anti-slave owners are worried that if it goes slave, they'll vote to make slavery legal everywhere. So both sides, true believers on both sides, rush into Kansas to vote. And they, they're not really moving to Kansas, but they pretend like they're moving to Kansas. They come into Kansas, they rent a place to stay, or they pitch a tent, and they register to vote, and they vote for slavery, and they vote for freedom. Now, here's the problem. If you've got people that are so dedicated to the idea that they're willing to move their family in order to vote, for, vote one way or the other, do you think they're also willing to commit violence? Absolutely. And the streets are bloody from the violence in the streets. There's so much violence happening. The election happens, and the election is so close that both sides claim they won. Both sides form a government. Both sides elect the governor. Both sides have a legislature. They have two different capitals. Shawnee becomes the capital of the slave government, while Topeka becomes the free soil government capital. And they each claim to be the sole government for all of Kansas. You can imagine how violent this is going to get. And to make matters worse, this guy, John Brown, shows up. That's him in the picture. John Brown was a preacher, an abolitionist, and by all accounts, a madman. He comes into Kansas with his family, believing his duty is to outlaw all slavery everywhere. He brings his family in. He brings his church members in. And they are one of these wild, out there, doomsday churches that believes the world is ending and that violence is sometimes necessary. In fact, so much so that at Potawatomi Creek, what a great name, Potawatomi. Potawatomi Creek is, an, uh, is a slave-owning community. And in the darkest hours in the middle of the night, John Brown, his sons, and other men from the church sneak down into this community and with swords... They kick doors in and execute people in their homes, men, women, and children, because they were slave owners. It's called the Potawatomi Massacre. In the South, John Brown is a monster. He's a murderer, and we want him killed. In the North, they wrote songs about him, and he was a hero, a folk hero, not unlike Robin Hood. He was killing people, but he was killing them for a cause, a good cause. And they were bad people anyway. In the end, the pro-slavery argument wins out. And in 1857, the Lee Compton Constitution is recognized as the official government of Kansas. Kansas falls to slavery. I'm going to tell you this story and we will quit there for the day because we can finish this all the next day. But I love this story. And I mentioned to you over and over again that the single biggest issue at the time period is slavery. And I think this shows how serious it was. Senator Charles Sumner was an anti-slavery senator who stood up on the floor of the U.S. Senate and verbally attacked the senior senator from South Carolina, a guy named Andrew Butler, for embracing slavery. And he eloquently waxed on about how 
slavery was a mortal sin. And that anybody that supported slavery or practiced slavery was complacent in this sin against man and God. Well, the person he was attacking was an elderly gentleman that really wasn't able to defend himself. But it turns out that Andrew Butler had a kinsman. I don't remember if he was a cousin or a brother-in-law or what, but he was a kinsman who happened to be the junior senator from South Carolina. And he was there in the chamber. His name was Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks doesn't much like the way this senator was acting. And he's not a young man. And he starts walking up there on his, with his cane. I can see him moving along pretty slow on the cane while Sumner is giving his speech. And when he gets before him, Sumner is just getting to the most eloquent part of the speech. And Preston Brooks starts hitting him upside the head with his cane. The senator literally beat, one senator was beating another senator unconscious. He broke his walking stick on the senator's head. When people heard about this, in the North, they called him a monster. How could, how could you do something like this? This is a Northern cartoon. Southern chivalry is arguments versus clubs. He's saying this picture, in the North, we just argue. In the South, they hit you. They're violent. They're terrible people. In the South, we liked it. In fact, when word got out that he'd broken his cane over them, he received over a hundred canes shipped in the mail to him with notes attached to them saying things like, hit him once for me. Okay? This is how divided we are. We can't even, even determine who a good guy and a bad guy is when one guy is hitting another with a walking stick until he's unconscious. Okay? That's how divided we are. All right. When we come back, we are going to do the birth of the Republican Party, uh, and we are going to fight the Civil War, and that should, t should get us through the rest of this class. Um, I'm going to go try and get on Blackboard right now and see if I can get your stuff up. Like I said, they, they, it wouldn't let me on earlier, but I will, I will give it a shot, okay? I'll see you guys later. Please don't forget to do your research paper.